Hello and welcome to this special web series on the Goa Inquisition. The series introduces you to the most recent research produced by internationally recognized scholars. I am Dale Luis Menezes. Our guests will give you a glimpse of their research as well as the research that has taken place over the last 50 or more years. You will hear directly from the experts about the nature of state and religious violence, as well as the challenges a historian faces in researching a difficult topic such as the history of the Inquisition. Our web series aims to educate the general public about the various aspects of this historical phenomenon. The web series is supported by the Alzulaj Collective in Goa. Additionally, the series is also supported by the History of the Inquisitions group a group of scholars spread across the world with institutional support from the Center for Religious History Studies at the Catholic University of Portugal and of the chair of the Shafadic Studies, Alberto Benveniste at the University of Lisbon. We thank them all for their generous moral support. Our guest today is Professor Angela Barreto Xavier, researcher of the Institute of Social Sciences, uh, University of Lisbon, she works, on, uh, she works on the early modern Portuguese empire in a comparative perspective. She has published several books, namely I in the Goa in 2008, Catholic Orientalism, Portuguese Empire, Indian Knowledge in 2015, co-authored with uh, Inez Supano, and Monarchia Shiberica in Perspectiva Comparada, Comparada in 2018 with Fe, uh, Federico Paloma and uh, Roberta Stumpf. Angela, uh, welcome to the to the series. Okay, thank you, Dario, for inviting me to, to participate in this, in this session. Right, and I, I think let's let's get to the to the first question. Uh, so, for some time now, historians of Christianity in India, uh, be it the early modern period, modern, or even the contemporary one have stressed that the history of Christianity in India is highly controversial. You researched the Portuguese empire as it developed in Goa, and your work indicates that the institutions of the early modern church were crucial for the Portuguese empire to thrive in the 16th century. As part of this imperial history, and although the Inquisition is not your primary area of research, you also argue that the existence of the Inquisition was an important institution that sustained state or imperial power. So could you talk a bit about why this topic is so controversial in India? Uh, this is a kind of difficult question with a difficult answer, actually, because um, indeed I, I was working on this uh, relationship between political power and religious power and the religious institutions, in the, in, namely in the, what I call the invention of Goa. Um, and the institution was, cert was certainly part, part of it. Um, but in order to, to understand uh, the role of inquisition, which um, in, this, in this context, we need to, I think that we need to historicize more uh, these, these processes. And, and uh, sometimes uh, we don't do it, or, and uh, especially in the public sphere, it's uh, complicated to to complexify uh, this, this process. And, um, and so, so uh, Inquisition was part of, the, of um, a frame, a political and administrative frame uh, that was quite typical, uh, not only of Portugal, uh, but, uh, but of several uh, political entities in Europe in, in the 16th century. Um, well, not all had in inquisition, but uh, but all of them had disciplinary institutions, and um, and they were very much related with the religious divisions that happened in Europe in in the in the mid 16th century, and uh, and with the needs uh, felt by 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 the princes of Europe, let's put it in that way, in this period, of um, of controlling the faith of, of their population. Uh, because there was this belief that the faith of the population was fundamental to the conservation, uh, the political conservation of territories. Uh, and so in, in the Catholic countries, you, you have inquisition, but, uh, but in the Protestant countries, you have other disciplinary institutions trying to do the same. That's the process that is called 
constitutionalization of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the European monarchies. Uh, so, so, so this broader context, I think it's important also to not singularize uh, Portuguese Inquisition and Goan Inquisition. So that said, uh, that said, uh, why why is Inquisition so controversial uh, in Indian history? Um, and um, I mean, Inquisition was really an awful institution. I I cannot. I'm not going to say otherwise. It was it was it was really mm, violent and uh, and it did uh, bad things. Uh, for sure, and I'm not going to try to to be indulgent uh, to to that, even with even if we should not judge the past. But um, but objectively thinking about it, it was it was not uh, a nice institution at all. Um, but it was again, I and I sh I'm going to stress this uh, this idea that the Inquisition that somehow I see in the public sphere, namely in blogs and uh, and sites uh, in India concerning the the India the Goan Inquisition, uh, that somehow it gives the, it centralizes the Inquisition all the all the evils of the Portuguese uh, Empire of imperialism itself. Uh, I think that is uh, quite wrong because because this is, for one hand, is is to to um, to give this institution a power that it didn't have as as, as big as it is portrayed by this uh, in this in this uh, kind of public sphere, and uh, on the other hand, it's uh, also a way of um, how to put it. Uh, Without being politically incorrect, it's it's also a way of um, not seeing other kinds of violence that were and were taking place in India and in different parts of India and uh, also in what could be called Hindu political entities. So so it uh, it is I think uh, um, a part of um, Hindu discourse. That can that can also obliterate obliterate the violence of uh, of uh, in in other places. Uh, it's easy when you make visible, very visible, something that is bad. Uh, the other, the rest seems to be nice and good. And uh, I'm not saying that it's really conscious. Uh, uh, it's uh, doing consciously to to prevent or to avoid or to obliterate a certain dimensions of the Indian past. But uh, but I think that the, the one of the consequences is is this. Is this. I quite agree with you that you know there is the need for nuance. Uh, there is a need to uh, ensure that the discussion isn't one-sided. Uh, uh, in addition to being, uh, in addition to um, having a discussion that is historically informed, right? Uh, so let, let's uh, let's move to the next question. And essentially, my next question is about the nature of the Portuguese Empire, right? So. Uh, uh, we, of course, want to uh, learn from you uh, about certain aspects of conversion to Catholicism in early modern Goa, because that's part of your work. But before that, I thought that uh, we need to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what the Portuguese empire was. Uh, you indicate throughout your work, and I'm thinking here about your uh, earlier book, I Invent Sound the Goa, uh, which roughly translate to the invention of Goa, that the existence of the Portuguese empire that is to say, uh, uh, state structures uh, was an important factor in the politics of conversion to, to Catholicism. Could you therefore give our viewers a brief outline of what the early modern Portuguese empire was? Um, could you also let us know, or could you also talk about how that empire changed over centuries? Because obviously, it's not just this one thing that starts in 1510 and remains the, remains the same, isn't it? Actually, I, I, I prefer to think that there was not the Portuguese Empire, in a, in a way, there were many Portuguese. I mean, there were. We can call it the Portuguese Empire, but it worked differently uh, in different places, and obviously, as you said, uh, very justly in, in different times. Uh, so, so one of the things the scholars are doing more and more is to not essentialize the very figure of the Portuguese Empire, and. Um, and when we think about the period I'm, I 
study for mostly the 16th and 17th century, this, this will very much apply. Uh, first, because, because uh, yes, in ending what concerns foreign people, at least until we can talk in the 16th century about two types of Portuguese empire. The scholars have already also referred to that so there is a kind of change uh, from sovereignty that is based on sovereignty to an empire that is more based on sovereignty. But in practice, these two types of the empire, one that is uh, more medieval, if you can that way, where the power of the king is not, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's uh, fragile and it's little and it's uh, really delegated mostly in the, in the local power. Um, these two types, actually, I must say, uh, in, the, in the first uh, three decades, four decades of the, uh, of the 16th century, surely the majority of the, of the places where the Portuguese had indirect rule. Uh, and this was the majority of places uh, where the Portuguese ruled, but actually they had an indirect rule. So, so they, they were like um, uh, extracting fiscal, uh, they had fiscal power and defensive power, but in, in military power, but in most of the things, life was actually managed by the by the local princes or local authors. Uh, this and this continued to be in many places of the Portuguese Empire, actually until the 18th century. But there were at least two places, main places, and, and Sri Lanka in the 16th, 17th century tried to be a third place, let's put it that way, where sovereignty became the, the main site of imperial rule. And, and this place was, was, was worse, a shore, um, uh, which became, as uh, what Katarina Madalas Santos explained many years ago, became the key to all India. Uh, and, but this was not from the beginning, this was something that happened uh, from the decade of 1530 onwards, uh, the center of South of India and where the Portuguese crown invested really much of, of, of its power and its rule and its uh, institution. And, and later on, Brazil, uh, which is a completely different story, actually, because it's a place of colonists and not exactly of colonized. So it's, it's also another type of uh, imperialism, and, uh, more, much more like outside the old Roman colonies, that was the model, Roman Empire was the model. Um, so, so you can see that already in the 16th century, you have a multiplicity of possibilities of being imperial. And uh, so you have, in a way, several empires uh, within the big structure that we call Portuguese Empire. And this changed uh, during the 17th and 18th century, also because the political culture of the Portuguese crown, of the Portuguese elite, and of, of the societies with whom they interacted, changed. And so it's, we, we cannot, we, we cannot, we should not think about this uh, uh, an entity, as you, you put it, that was unchallenged and unchanged with this period. It's multiplicity, complexity, I think it's, it's uh, diversity, also, it's uh, are the objectives that uh, that occurred to me to speak about. Uh, I'm, I'm also reminded now of your own uh, teacher, Antonio Manuel Hispania, uh, who's kind of, I don't know if decentralization is the right word, but at least from once the Marquis of Pombal comes in, that's when the empire starts to centralize, isn't it? Isn't, isn't that the general sense? Like you have like a very decentered kind of a administrative structure and it's only in the late 18th century that that centralization as uh, as we know it happens within the Portuguese Empire. Yeah, and then we um, explained very well that politi main political culture, the dominant political culture of Portuguese uh, elites and society during the 16th and 17th century, for sure, was the uh, pluralism. This concept of jurisdiction, so each institution had this, uh, this uh, step of power that was not to be shared, not even with the king. And, and, and the king had also this understanding that there was this distribution of power. Okay, 
uh, and I fully agree with that. It's also true, and, and this change of sovereignty to sovereignty is also a change in the political culture. So in the sense uh, towards the uh, increasing centralization of power and the less distribution of, of power, uh, within the, the, the institutions of the culture uh, and, and so this are, but but it, it is not a process that happens from one moment to another. When when like when I say from 1530s onwards in India or in Goa, there is a, a change in, in implementation of policy. Uh, I think there was the intention of doing it, and there were many expressions. But the agents, the Portuguese agents that were in place, uh, they they were majority of them shared a different kind of political culture. So so also the implementation of this policy were were what were um, dependent on these uh, sometimes conversion, sometimes inversion. Uh, ways of understanding what the power was, uh, how should it be used, who had the right to use it, uh, and so forth. So, yes, yes, it's right. not exactly decentralization, it's more uh, division of power. Right, right. Right. Right, and on that note, on the, the note of multiplicity, as you as you stress, let's uh, let's talk now about like religion and you know kind of like the main focus of this web series. So, what role did religion play in empire? Or to state the question in another way, uh, what role did empire or politics uh, play in religion? And I, I over here, I wanted to also refer to the work of A.K. Priyolkar. Uh, how does your work differ or is similar to the broad conclusions drawn by uh, Priyolkar uh, about half a century uh, ago? Yeah, um, well, I, I must say that my work uh, does not differ in many conclusions from the first uh, Priyolkar's uh, great book, uh, the, traditional, the Golden Tradition. Um, yes, in many senses, we have a similar conclusion. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think I do differ from Creole Kaiser, even if he, uh, I mean, it's, it's really a great historian and tries to, uh, to, and try to, to assemble many sources, the ones that were available in the period when, when we wrote. Now we have access to, to other sources. Um, and, uh, but, but where, where do I differ? Uh, I think I differ. First, because I use also different sources than the ones that uh, Priyalka used, uh, namely uh, some administrative sources that usually are not used to, to, to think about these things like uh, the inventories of land. Um, well, uh, Priyalka also refers to them, but don't, don't analyze them uh, the, way I, the way I do, uh, because I think that he still has a very much top-down approach uh, to, 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 to this issue, uh, which I also have, actually. Uh, I, but I try to complement this more uh, evenly, I would say, in my work with uh, I, I try to, to call it a bottom-up approach, even if it's a very imperfect bottom-up approach. But, uh, but when I, well, I was doing my TV, I was trying, uh, well, my, my, one of my supervisors, one was Antonio Manuel Schreiner, and the other one was Kirti Chaudhry, and he was uh, always talking about the need of doing the polyphonic story, or oh, history. So, uh, and, uh, and that was one of the best things I've learned also with him, which was the uh, need of doing the polyphonic history, uh, to hear the voices of the uh, of the different agents and to put them uh, all together. Sometimes this is not why nice to listen to because it's not like a symphony most of the time. It's not. But uh, but uh, it's by doing that that you can can have a more um, fair uh, understanding of, of, of historical process uh, by trying to balance one thing and the other. And um, and I, I I mean uh, I think the Priyalka's work is really very important also to 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 provide this frame uh, where politics and religion was intermingled for sure interwoven and mingled uh, for, and really interdependent 
but uh, but uh, but I think that it's not so clear in this work. Uh, this that we were talking about to Antonio Manuel Espanha uh, earlier. That was this uh, multiplicity of sites of power, and this multiplicity of sites of power were not only uh, related with the Portuguese monarchy and institutions, uh, local local society also had power itself, its own power. It was a different, and also political power, uh, local elites also had. So Michel Foucault uh, talks about microphysics of power and, uh, and the power is everywhere. Uh, obviously, it's, it's uh, well, it's a quite in uh, insightful uh, understanding of things, but, uh, and also can be, um, dangerous in the sense that then you can just forget about the violence of the, of, of the dominance and the, and the fragility of the and weakness of, of the dominated. Yes, uh, it's true, we, we have to be careful. But on the other hand, we we have to think, and I do believe it, that, that the sites of power are much multiple. Uh, I, I don't think, and I think I, we cannot think, it's not reasonable to think that uh, at a certain moment, there is a, a power that has all concentrates all power, and then uh, the society or the dominated that you know, are powerless. Uh, this is not possible. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we, we just have to think that uh, the population of the world conquered the power in the mid uh, in the in the beginning of the 16th century, mid 17th 16th century, was kind more or less 10 percent of the portuguese population at all as a whole so you you can see if uh, in portuguese uh, uh, people agents were elsewhere were in north africa were in the western coast of africa were in the eastern coast of africa were in other parts of india uh, it's unthinkable to think that they had so such a power that could uh, impose this uh, such like uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a reason. So. so just to clarify, and I don't want to ask a leading question also. So when I say empire and religion, I shouldn't assume that empire is all powerful, uh, which uh, kind of imposes uh, its power, whether religious or state, um, without the, without uh, the, the, let's say, role of, of, of the local society. Did I, did I, did I get, get, get it correct? Did I understand it? Yes, uh, you did. I mean, uh, obviously, there is uh, an imposing uh, intention. So I'm not saying that there is no imposing intention. There is definitely an imposing intention. And, uh, and uh, there is imposition. Uh, well, um, the, depending on the, how, uh, on the military power that the Portuguese has, in, in different ways. Uh, that is also clear that negotiation was much bigger when, when military power was weaker and uh, was, uh, was, uh, the imposition was higher when military power was also uh, stronger. That, uh, in, in, in for sure, in Goa, there is an intention of doing it. There's an intention of creating a new portal, uh, of Lusitanizing, Westernizing uh, in the mid 16th century. Then. Uh, there is. Um, given, uh, given, if we think about the demographic imbalance, if the local, uh, and when I think about the local people, and I'm, well, that's my argument now that mainly local elites were the ones that, uh, that really thought that uh, this kind of legal and political framework could be also a window of opportunity. To, for them to a kind of social mobility um, that without this, I'm sure, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure that it was very difficult for the Portuguese to conserve that power uh, in, in the territory as well. Because, because actually I think that in a way it was easier, was easier to conquer than to conserve. Uh, it, to conquer could be a, a moment uh, of conquering and mili where military, um, Power was enough in order to, to, to get the territory. Well, to keep it, to keep it when there was such an imbalance for centuries, like for five centuries, uh, 
it was not possible in my view without uh, without the um, cooperation collaboration using choice i prefer to use the word choice uh, as the, as the, as part of the powerful people of the local society uh, and the, yeah uh, i so 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 i think there was imposition for sure there was the violence the imperial violence for sure but to, but to, but there was also um there were also interests local interests that facilitated all, all, all this process and that um, well uh, even Priyalka refers to it now that the communal detentions that that were um, helping the Portuguese to, to, to try it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I think it was really fundamental for, for the, the, the durability of the project. Mm. Right, and I think uh, you may have touched upon something that I wanted to ask next, and that was uh, in a similar way about, you know, um, conversion uh, to, to Catholicism. Uh, so, uh, so very briefly, I just wanted you to reflect upon uh, when we talk about conversion, we also talk about, say, power and uh, and many of the things that you mentioned about, you know, it's uh, it's hegemony at one hand, it's also a negotiation on the other. Uh, but more specifically, I just wanted to maybe you could quickly uh, reflect uh, or very briefly reflect of whether if an inquis uh, institution like the Inquisition had a um, wise-like grip on the population of Goa, right? And we've just discussed the whole uh, problem with kind of imagining a, a, a very all-powerful leviathan, so to speak, uh, as, as historians are so used to kind of thinking of, like, you know, uh, older empires. Um, so would that be true? Like, would it, uh, in your opinion, would the Inquisition over a period of three centuries have like a wise-like grip on the population? Well, uh... Yeah, well, I, I will answer yes and no. Uh, I'm sorry uh, for not always giving them. Um, and very... that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, yes, in a way, yes, uh, especially from the 17th century onwards. We have to think that uh, we know that Inquisition in the beginning was not uh, orientated to, to, to Indian people of Indian origin. But, uh, but uh, the people of Jewish origin, and uh, many of them can be actually from and uh, and uh, in the second half of the century, uh, 15th century, I would say that it was still the, the, the main focus uh, of, the, of, the, of the Inquisition. Uh, well, from 1575 onwards, um, I would say, it's, uh, when, when the people of Indian origin that have converted to Catholicism start to be able to be, to be on the process of, of, of Inquisition. Um, namely, when uh, I, I, I talk about it in my book, somehow, uh, I think that in the beginning there was a kind of, uh, of uh, what I call, um, uh, so there was a kind of many among missionaries, and we, uh, and we should really understand that Inquisition was not concerned with conversion. Uh, it was not its jurisdiction. Inquisition was concerned with conserving a product. So that, that was, uh, this has to be, yeah, and sometimes in these discussions, there is um, um, a confusion and, and, and an understanding that Inquisition has the institution responsible for conversion. And, and uh, conversion was in the hands of missionaries, uh, mainly and uh, as parish priests of, uh, of the bishops uh, and uh, and uh, and to secular and regular uh, orders, uh, secular power, secular um, flourishing. And the Inquisition was uh, concerned, like in Portugal, actually, with uh, with keeping up the state in Orthodox Islam. And obviously, when you start to have more and more converted people, that they become uh, uh, one of the targets of the Inquisition, and they will become the main target uh, of the Inquisition. And it is also true that the Inquisition of Goa uh, did something that was uh, somehow violating its own, its own, its own uh, jurisdiction, because they started to be interested in people that were not 
converted yet and uh, in pushing them towards uh, conversion but and also converging with with this uh, legal frame that was uh, penalizing penalizing i don't know if i can say it in english um the people that did not convert taking their lands uh, uh, limiting their their local power etc etc and and, uh, and you can see that the uh, inquisitors tend to support very much this uh, these policies and uh, it's true uh, tend to, to to be heavy they have a heavy hand towards those that uh, divide uh, that are the divides to, to the to the malicious authority which are many obviously because because in the at least uh, well I, I would say that the majority of the population of Goa uh, the demographic majority that converted in the in the second half of the start of the 17th century uh, were uh, were many things uh, were many things they were not only uh, they were some of them were nominally Christian uh, others were more or less Christian but they were also other things because obviously uh, religious uh, allegiance is not something that happens also from one day to another and uh, and obviously there were many uh, for in the inquisition uh, perception there were many uh, many places people uh, situations behaviors that were uh, that were that needed to be restrained needed to be punished and, and this was a long-term uh, long um, um, process that said, um, uh, we again, I, I, can, I cannot see institutions as, uh, as um, immobile entities. The institutions are made by people, uh, are made by people. And, uh, and we cannot pretend, and we have all today data that show it, that inquisitors were all the time, uh, all the effort. There were majority of them were surely uh, on, on that on that. As were well, many other members of either religious people or political people that were against the, some of the methods uh, towards conversion, keeping Christianity, and so, so there were many internal debates about what should have been done and how should have to have been done on one hand, and on the other hand, there were members of the institution that they had completely different behavior. Uh, I, I, I recall one case uh, that is of, uh, in the 17th century, the Franciscan prior Simon de Nazaré, that was a member of the institution, he was the uh, father of the Christians in the British. And in a report of the institution of 1532, he's, uh, he's uh, described as someone that has many local friends in the British. Who he protects? I mean, Indian friends. Who he protects, and uh, and who is he saved from being persecuted by Inquisition, for example? And he was a member of the Inquisition, so, but he had his own interests. He was. Uh, I, I cannot say because we don't have really much information. I mean, Bruno Feitler now is working um, very much on that, the personal of Inquisition, but we we are still far. From knowing more about the, the this personal, their stories, their interests, uh, but uh, and I, I cannot tell you that there are many cases like Simon uh, Benetere, but I I would say that uh, it's not the only case. So these people have yeah, their own interests, local interests. They are Portuguese, they are inquisitors or members of the institution, but they have their networks, local networks, uh, and and uh, they use. Institutions pragmatically, and uh, and also sometimes local to use institution pragmatically. So so yes and no. Uh, yes uh, yes that was the, the main primary thing. Then we when we start to to go to do micro analysis of uh, of institution and the, the people that to compose it and how they act it, uh, and um, then we can see that there are um, there is not only again only one institution there is a main institution that there are also 
also other practices and other types of Right, and, and I, I take your point that always politics and ideologies on the ground work in a different and a complex, you know, like in intricate way, let's put it that way. Uh, I uh, Next, I wanted to, so we've talked about uh, uh, violence and, you know, relating to like the Inquisition, uh, but uh, any discussion of early modern forms of violence in empire uh, presupposes and Pre, uh, presupposes a pre-existing society, right? Um, in other words, uh, there was a non-European or a non-Catholic history in the regions that became Goa, right? And as you as you uh, observed earlier, in common parlance, one would refer to this pre-Portuguese history as Goa's Hindu past, right? Thus, uh, one implicitly makes a comparison between what was pre-Portuguese and what uh, what became Portuguese. Uh, is it possible then to know this pre-Portuguese politics, economy, and culture? Um, could you try to reflect on, say, what other local forms of violence were there pre-Portuguese? Uh, and I know that there's a near lack of sources uh, for writing this history, uh, but I would think that it is important to uh, to kind of discuss this if we are going to discuss the kind of European or the Portuguese forms of violence. Uh, yeah, definitely. I totally agree with that. I Actually, in my PhD dissertation, I had uh, written 100 pages about it, uh, which uh, then uh, I was not, uh, and then I thought I have thought about publishing when I had a separate side on, on uh, and it was uh, called, uh, I, I, now I cannot recall exactly the title, but it was like political culture and social organization of Goa uh, at the time of the arrival of the Portuguese. So I, I, I rather prefer them the pre Portuguese. Uh, um, um, and uh, and I was trying to pull together different information that was I was able to collect about Goa in the at that time you know, of the Portuguese arrival. Uh, also using the sources from the surrounding territories because because we um, well in general we presuppose that Goa was. A uh, singular identity with different cultural um, um, autonomy in a way. Um, and um, that's why I call it the invention of Goa, because I don't think that, uh, that there was such a thing that was a pre Portuguese Goa and, and uh, a Portuguese Goa, uh, because Goa was dominated by many and different, uh, well, was always dominated by different. Uh, Political entities, so and, and not all together. Uh, parts were part of one, and uh, if uh, there, there was not such a um, an, an autonomous uh, entity, uh, a territorial entity, um, for all well, before the Portuguese for, for, for many centuries. Um, so I tried to 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 have a kind of regional, let's put it in that way, approach to the history of Goa trying to read uh, scholarship about other places, uh, about South India in general, in order to, to be able to read against the grain what the sources that, uh, that uh, persisted. Uh, and uh, one of the conclusions uh, I, I tried to, and, and then I, I used this information in my book, The Invention of War, but they were, it was not uh, like a chapter, but it was uh, appearing here, here and there. But one of uh, the conclusions uh, was I tried to, to, to put forward in this, in this chapter of my original dissertation was that um, precisely contrary, in contrast with the Orientalist uh, understanding of this pre Portuguese Goa that still perceives. And, uh, and I think that it's a very Brahmanical uh, still understanding of, of this period now, and uh, that was taken for granted that, uh, like, the villages were, were, were autonomous and uh, somehow harmonious and uh, um, integrated and all that stuff. Uh, what, what, uh, what I've, uh, uh, the, the conclusions I've, I've reached that moment, it was uh, almost 20 years ago, but but uh, but uh, my up, uh, research after that has um, somehow confirmed my my insight from that time in that period. If that, that was not such a thing, uh, it, it, uh, I mean, 
obviously there was an organization inside the villages and so forth, but we cannot just take for granted that this was working smoothly because we know that so people were converted to, to, to Islam during the, the, we don't know how many people, but we know that what people were converted to Islam during the, the precedent uh, domination. Uh, some of the people, uh, as we know, by forged sources, namely in the, in the, at the first decades of the, the, of the 16th century, were in these villages. Uh, for sure, these, these created a conversion to Christianity, created later tension inside the villages themselves. Besides what we call the case question, uh, we know that the word was also brought up by the Portuguese. So, so, so again, it's not easy to, to talk about case uh, in the terms that were used from the 19th century onwards when thinking about 16th century Goa. But, but uh, I, I, it's, it was quite clear from the, the after history, uh, at, after the Portuguese arrival history of these villages, that uh, there were lots of conflicts also uh, inside inside the villages. Uh, there was social violence uh, for sure. The Portuguese town was offering the lands of transfer of lands from non Christians to Christians and uh, were giving lands to poor people. Not, I'm not saying the majority of them, but, but perhaps enough of these people in order to to to, to challenge the the, the balances uh, in, in the in the villages and so on so why they they could see also in christianity a kind of um, of opportunity because we cannot forget even if the practice was not there that uh, that the uh, discourse of christianity was a discourse of human dignity and equality uh, and and um, and, uh, and actually, there is a very interesting decree of the Portuguese king of 1542 saying that all the people of Goa, if they were Christian, Christian independently of their nation or generation, they have the same privilege as the Portuguese people. And, and this, this was like uh, the embodiment of, of the, the Christian message. It was, uh, then the practice was completely different. But, uh, but uh, we can see this flag to be interesting for for, for some people. And, uh, and this very fact shows precisely the tension uh, that existed in the Indian society at the time of the arrival of the Portuguese. So do I think it is possible to recover these history? I think that uh, unfortunately, and due to the Portuguese, uh, many of the local archives just, uh, just disappear. But I also think, uh, I'm, I tried to do recently in my um, rereading of Toral Mishia, that is the document from 1526. I think that if we really have this Indian and regional uh, reading of the Portuguese sources, so we really have to know much more of the South Indian history of, uh, uh, and regional history, we can, we can really find uh, information that allows us to not to have a great and very deep description of Goan society or uh, of the societies of the territories that we call later Goa, let's keep it in that way, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, richer and that will really help us to, to understand these processes in a, in, a, in a more democratic way, which is to give uh, the, the right way to to, to these populations in, in, this, in this process. I think we are still uh, far from achieving this, but uh, that's why I, I believe that we, we can do this. Yes, and I particularly like the idea about kind of reading a particular degree as, you know, uh, in reaction to or, or uh, suggesting a pre-existing condition and, and, and we need to, of course, do it with, with caution. Um, my next question uh, would, uh, I wanted to talk to you about your rather recent work, especially the work that you did in Catholic Orientalism with, uh, um, with Ines Supano, where you looked at the identity making processes, as you call it, of the local elites. But uh, in your other work, as you just mentioned, you also look like uh, you look at a top, bottom, uh, bottom up approach where 
you look at the subaltern. So uh, on the one hand, what can you tell us about the role of elites in this identity making processes within the Portuguese empire? And secondly, uh, what can it also tell us about the role of uh, these uh, local subalterns who converted to Catholicism? I know that there is, again, uh, sources are a problem. And uh, and, I, and I can only uh, recall the novel by Maplesh Versailles, which was published first in uh, Nagri Konkani. And subsequently, it has an English and a Marathi translation as well. The English translation is Age of the Frenzy. So which kind of gives a slightly different perspective, I would say a nuanced perspective about why the subaltern converted and what were like the pre-existing social forms of exclusion and violence. Uh, so in your research, what can you tell us about both this broad two sections of the local society. Well, um, as you can know, uh, I have been I have been mainly working with the elites, but actually, uh, the elites are the ones that left with more historical traces in, in the document. On one hand, and on the other hand, because because uh, well, um, I've always used much uh, social sciences uh, theories of uh, the way of finding my own my own research. And uh, also in the sociology of elites, um, tends to show that the uh, elites, um, well, uh, usually try to conserve their power. It's uh, kind of, we cannot generalize completely, but it's uh, um, a common rule, let's put it that way. When you, are, when you have power, you try to conserve it. You don't want to lose it for many different reasons. Uh, one is because your um, way of living, if you lose that power, you should also lose that way of living. And uh, and so so my my own thesis, as you know, is that without this uh, the role of the local elites, Portuguese power would not would be able to 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 be so long in in Goa. And uh, and that was mainly or very much because these elites, or majority of these elites. Uh, did uh, did uh, did um, want did want did not want to lose their 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 local power and uh, and they would definitely lose it if they did not convert when they realized that uh, uh, and that, again I'm talking majority of people not not all uh, but when they did realize that. Uh, that was not easy to get rid of the Portuguese as, uh, as they expected in the beginning uh, and the Portuguese policies changing. Um, their choice uh, was, was, well, uh, was in order to keep uh, their local power and not to, even with the intention of keeping their faith or their devotion or their ritual um, tradition at the same time. Uh, I think actually that, uh, that was what probably um, in, in the beginning, um, but uh, but what uh, what happened in the uh, I again I would say with the most of the, the of the local elites when they converted and then when they were submitted uh, and engaged in the process of Christianization pragmatically or not it's very difficult today to 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 really know uh, the intentionalities. Uh, of these people. Uh, I tend to think that in general it's more pragmatic in the beginning than, than, than generally. Uh, the truth is that uh, the relationship with memory, uh, as we know, changes uh, depending on our historical experiences. And, and, uh, and, uh, and we can see that uh, in, the, in the end of the 17th century, uh, these local elites that were Christianized, uh, also again pragmatically or not, uh, tend to, to, to what Homi Baba called um, mimetize the but uh, but uh, mimetize the, the Portuguese and um, and to become Portuguese like and, and it was, this was somewhat predicted by the missionaries in the 16th century. I mean, you have many re writings of missionaries saying they now do not believe, but one day then their grandchildren will, will be the best soldiers. Uh, for, for your majesty, for example, that's uh, one, one line in one missionary letter of, of the 16th century. So, so this prediction, uh, in what concerns the local elites, for sure it, uh, it, uh, it worked out. Um, and we still have today, uh, not many, but uh, some people of this uh, descent that, uh, that are fully engaged with the Portuguese uh, 
uh, culture or weaponized or uh, still today, uh, not less and less, but still today we, we, we do have things. Um, concerning the, the subaltern uh, the, and the history from below that we can, we can, we can do in, 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 in relation to Goa, oh, well, this is, this is really a difficult topic um, to, to deal with. Uh, and it's uh, at the same time, it's uh, how to put it that way, it's the most unfair thing because the demographic majority is uh, usually uh, the stories of the dem demographic majority are usually untold uh, or, or they are told uh, in, with micro cases because you cannot, uh, you don't have much more than that. Uh, I, I, I think that. Um, inquisition records that now have been uh, more and more discovered can be somehow, besides also again, a, re a reading against the grain of the uh, missionary records that are really many, uh, but we have to be very careful uh, with, with that reading uh, and to try to see what is descriptive of this of these uh, records and what is narrative, what is not such an easy thing to do. Uh, but I think that the combination of, of uh, different sources can give us insights about the, about the, the lives of the Balkan. And if we are lucky, um, we will find one, one day or another uh, some for example, you know, we know that inquisition processes are one of the best way or judicial processes to access to, to unprivileged people um, conditions. Um, and we have to invest more and more on, on this uh, type of sources, I think, in order to be able to access for more, not uh, again, it will be difficult to I would say to have um, a real deep um, analysis of, of, of these uh, populations, but I think we can we, we can tell stories. We will be able to tell stories, um, and more and more stories we will tell. Then we will have a better image of them. Yes. Right, and I'm also reminded about the case of Chorao that you researched about and its uh, relationship to, you know, the the uh, earliest convert population, the subaltern population, and and how they, how how that uh, relationship to the to the land ownership changed. Uh, could you maybe just briefly talk about that because that could be a good illustration of what we are talking about when we talk about subaltern agency in this context, right? Uh, yes, I, I think that the case I say to the peak in Shrao is decidedly based on missionary records and the inventories of land uh, and trying to read them against the grain. Um, it um, illustrates well when I say when what I was saying in the beginning about the, the size of power can be um, multiplied and be manifold. And, uh, and we can see uh, in this case, this is from this presentation uh, I did of this, of this report, that um, um, the missionaries themselves realize that uh, the power that, uh, that some subalterns have and, could be, and how they could help in the process of conversion, namely in what concerns the services that they play, play to the community. So, the, so missionaries they realized that uh, that um, if these people uh, that were playing this service to the elite did not be uh, did not perform this service, the elite uh, were unable to recycle their status of the elite and of their rights of reason. And uh, and so if we think about all this together, then we can also try to grasp how uh, some of these people uh, saw uh, their, their ways of striving through the, their, this, uh, this, uh, their well, uh, the social order, the new social order in order to, to, to be better off. We have seen that already we, uh, in the time of marriages uh, of Ponce of Cerc, uh, uh, the ones that were promoted in, in, the, in the second aspect. 
second decade of the, the, the 15th century, when the, the daughters of the local elite didn't want to marry the Protestant Soviets, but, but the unprivileged, the daughters of unprivileged people did want to marry the Protestant Soviets that were granted with mercies, with limbs, and so forth. Right, and if you think about the unprivileged section who either got, were, were, were willing to get married or or or, or convert, uh, it also, I think, as you said earlier, speaks to a pre-existing or a pre-Portuguese, let's say, uh, social conflict, right? And so, uh, this is another way to also think about uh, think about this uh, this earliest moment uh, and a few decades before the earliest moment of the Portuguese in a much more um, historically informed uh, way. Finally, before uh, before we end this interview, I just wanted to know what uh, what you're researching currently, what we can read from you in the years to come. I know this year has been or last year has been difficult. Uh, it's not it's not the best uh, time to do research because archives are closed and so on and so forth. Uh, but still, uh, if you if you could give us a, a glimpse of what what what's to come in the future. Yeah, well, um, actually, I'm involved in too many projects, so um, the fact I will, I like to take three, just three, well, three is enough uh, of them. Uh, when when I, I have a project that is uh, concerning public reports in, in the Portuguese Empire, and uh, and one of the one of the goals of the project is to is also to 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 identify and to discuss and to analyze what we call it's in common the rituals of the others or the others in the in the in the public rituals of the country and uh, and in this context i i'm trying to discuss uh, well more intensely uh, something that is very present in the Portuguese process of the 15th and 17th century which is the the, the banishment of, of um, wedding rights of the, of the local people or the, the yes uh, there is it is a, a long debate from the mid 16th century until and until almost the mid 18th century actually so we have uh, people against and for uh, and with many different positions during this period and this is also a great source because of this Precisely to, to to think about what we were talking previously about the lives of the of the people that uh, lived in Goa by the time well the, now it's not just by the time of the Portuguese arrival but to, uh, the persistence of the of, of ritual practices of, uh, cult, of different cultural practices for centuries it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, a very interesting way of, of thinking about about the uh, so this is one of the, 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 the research I'm doing now, uh, which converges in a way, uh, so I'm very interested precisely in the, in the local society, with, uh, with another project I'm involved in, uh, but it's coordinated by my colleague of mine, which, uh, which is called um, well, we, we, we had very many difficulties in finding the right word, but it's called Native Archive. And it's about to, precisely to, to, to I prefer the word, the word local, uh, the archives of local society. And, um, and uh, this, this, um, in this project, I'm working to, with more systematically with something that I was and that's quite interesting in, this, uh, in my PhD thesis and other scholars have also used this, uh, this collection of the lives of communities of books of communities of uh, uh, So the, the, the books are, were, were read with the decisions of the company. And, and this, this is a mine. This is definitely a mine. It's an amazing source, uh, even with now many books that are in very bad shape. So, difficult to read, but it's a mind for many different things, namely for understanding this uh, compliance of uh, elite with the Portuguese power, or the persistence uh, also under the Portuguese rule of the villagers and villagers that did not uh, comply so much, and that you can see, for example, in the writing in Portuguese or not of this book, uh, some villagers do 
the writing in Portuguese very early, while others never do it. And, uh, and even if the Portuguese crown is always saying, you have to write in Portuguese, and then they say, yes, in two years we promise that we will do it, and then they don't do it. Uh, so so I'm, I'm working on this project to understand what I call the micro, imperial micro politics um, in, in, in Goa or, uh, or politics at the level of the village uh, in an imperial context. So, so, so I hope we have interesting findings on that. And finally, I'm looking to, uh, again to something that has been studied uh, by scholars which is the uh, same as the Volta de um, in 1797, with, uh, which is, um, which is um, by using, well, by working with the uh, with judicial process, which is a huge source with uh, many local voices and uh, very interesting information uh, on the political culture of, of this, uh, the elites that engage in the, this. Uh, um, not happen. That, that be, to, to happen revolt that did not happen because it was discovered before it, it, it took place. So, so these are the three main uh, investigations I'm I'm trying to do now. And that sounds extremely fascinating. I, for one, uh, I am really looking forward to all these three uh, three projects. Uh, uh, and 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 I feel that this work is uh, is really timely, and uh, you know, it should have happened before. But anyways, you know, it will happen in the future, so we should all, we can only be glad about it. Uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you for the the, the rich uh, reflections for 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 bringing such so much nuance to to several of these issues that we've discussed. Uh, uh, one of my greatest takeaways from this conversation is that uh, it's easy to conquer but not to conserve. And I think that lesson, and I like to le learn lessons from history, uh, goes for uh, applies as much to empire as to as to religion as to I guess local society and the village organization. Um, Thank you once again uh, for for your time. Thank you, Dale, for and to all the organizations for inviting me. So it's great that you can really provide this uh, discussion for us, for us, so that's the way of uh, sharing uh, our understanding of these processes and surely for the people that that uh, can see this uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you again and to our viewers, thanks for watching.